Very excited about my next guest, who was a would-be accountant. He dropped out of mathematics at Oxford University, as I understand it, and turned his attention to comedy. It seems as though that was the right decision because he has sellout shows in Edinburgh, in the Melbourne Comedy Festival, and now he's coming once again to The Fringe. Here is a taste of Paul Fush. Um, I just want to uh, mention something that is a bit of a, quite a bit of a worry, actually. Serious concern, this is. Why is it, why is it that whenever we receive a slice of homemade cake from someone, that we always have to say it's moist? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a horrendous business, isn't it? I mean, we can laugh about it now, but it's, it's absolutely awful, isn't it? Because we, when you get a slice of cake, all you want to do, really, is just eat it quietly with your own thoughts. You know, which are generally that it's slightly on the dry side. <laughs> but obviously you, you can't say that because the law of the world states that you must mention it's moist. And it's not just about mentioning it's moist, there's, also, there's more to it than that. I mean, there, there are also time constraints linked to it. I mean, that's what makes it such a nightmare. I mean, I would say, as soon as the cake comes out, you have got five to six seconds to mention the moistness. <laughs> if you don't mention the moistness within that time window, then the atmosphere will deteriorate rapidly. <laughs> <laughs> Paul Foote, great to have you in the studio and in Adelaide. It's very nice to be here, Belinda. It is so true, isn't it? When you are given a, a cake, you must say it's moist. Absolutely, otherwise, with the, it's just one of those things that... We have to do, but we don't analyse. Well, I do. It's my job to analyse these things yeah. that no one else analyses. Otherwise, we just drift through life just saying, hmm, isn't it moist? You just know instinctively you have to. If you don't mention that it's moist, it's just disaster. Is it tiresome analysing the day-to-day -day intricacies of life or do you enjoy it? It comes well, naturally to you. That is the burden that has fallen upon me, Belinda, to uh, analyse the world and make it funny. It's a, it's a nightmare. I mean, because obviously I'm always constantly thinking of seeing the humour in everything. So mm. it makes it very t tiring, you know. I'm mm. always going around thinking, oh, there's a, I've just seen the humour in that, I've seen the humour in that. I'm doubled up laughing most of the time. But surely for things like Lance Armstrong talking and, and allegedly confessing to, to Oprah Winfrey, you wouldn't see the humour in that? No, well, uh, I, has he actually, he has confessed now. Has Allegedly. He? Allegedly. Mm. Mm. It is, the whole thing is quite amusing on some level, just because it's, it's, it's all so unpleasant, so sordid, isn't it? <laughs> I love that word, sordid. <laughs> now tell us, your show coming to the Fringe uh, at Cinema Nova in, uh, in mid-March is, uh, is titled Kenny Larch is dead. Now, I've never heard of Kenny Larch, but it, it saddens me to hear that he's passed away. Who is he? Well, I don't know either. Right. Uh, the show, in common with all my other shows, has a title that is completely independent of the content of the show <laughs> and, indeed, of any publicity material relating to the show. I mean, there's no reason for it. Well, it all starts... Actually, the reason why the show is called Kenny Larch is Dead is because... Uh, last year I was just sitting, having lunch with someone, and then I said, oh, wouldn't it be funny if I called my management up, my, you know, like my agent, and said, Kenny Larch is dead? But I, <laughs> it was just made up, you know, I'd never heard of Kenny Larch. So I just rang up and said, oh, have you heard? Kenny Larch is dead. But it all backfired because my management were in a really serious mood. And they just said, who's Kenny Larch? What's going on? And then they said, we need to talk to you about things. You've got to go to San Francisco to do some filming. What are you talking about Kenny Larch for? And it all sort of backfired in a terrible way. And that night I was on stage performing and I just kept going on and on about it. Have you heard? Kenny Larch is dead. And some people were saying, oh, we heard. You know, some people played along with it. And other people would say, who? What? And other people would be... Just Genuinely upset because maybe they knew someone called Kenny Larch is dead. <laughs> anyway, after that, I just said to my manager, "Let's call the show Kenny Larch is dead," and I, I wasn't expecting him to say yes, but he's he agreed to it. And then that was another disastrous name for one of my shows. Oh. The show that I did one before that was called Ash in the Attic, Ooh. and I have no idea why it was called Ash in the Attic. In fact, that was more or less a joke because there's a show in Britain called Cash in the Attic. Ooh. So I just. 
one time my manager just said, oh, we need to give a name to the show. And I thought, oh, gosh. Uh, and it was all like a rush. And I just said, uh, uh, I thought of Cash in the Attic. I just, said, I just said, Ash in the Attic, which I thought was just a joke. But then before I knew it, the it's show not... had been called that. What's Cash in the Attic about? What's the show? Cash? Well, it's got nothing to do with Cash in the Oh, the Attic. Cash yeah, in the Attic. What, what is that? I show? don't know. I've never seen oh, it. <laughs> <laughs> I've no idea. I just, I just called the show sort of Ash in the Attic. But anyway, the point is that Kenny Larch is dead is irrelevant to the mm. show, mm. just like all my shows. Is in fact everything in the show is irrelevant. In fact, I actually give a a money back guarantee, a, Do po- you? a pointless evening, or your money back. <laughs> so if there's anything in it that you think has any meaning at all, is or is worth listening to in any way then you your money back straight away. And has anyone ever taken you up on that? Oh, no, there's no, no, there's no point to the show. <laughs> but the show, basically, it's... Uh, uh, in case people hadn't realised, it's quite alternative. <laughs> and uh, it starts off with me just saying nonsense, silly stories I've made up for my head for about 43 mm. minutes. Then we have um, airline anagrams, anagrams based around airlines. And then we've complete the show with what I call my madness. Mm. My madness, it's just me saying things that don't make any sense but are inexplicably funny. You are a funny man. And you know, as women, we don't need good-looking men, but we love men that make us laugh. And it would strike me that you would have a bevy of admirers following you around the globe. Am I right? Well, it's like a harem. (laughs) (laughs) Harem. Yeah, of different women who all just laugh at my every word. Feeding you grapes and... Things like that. Yes. How would you pick up somebody at a bar? What would what would you say to them? <laughs> I, I wasn't expecting to be asked questions mm. like that when I came into the interview. How would I pick someone up in a yeah, bar? What would you say to them? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I've made you laugh. That's good. Uh, well, I got um, actually. Uh, I don't do it myself, but I do know of uh, pe- uh, connoisseurs of mine. Connoisseurs are members of my fan club. They're connoisseurs of my humour, and I do know some of them who actually do pick up women. With my jokes, <laughs> like um, like one of them is the one about um, oh, uh, what, what's it? Oh, uh, the other day, uh, the when I was little, my pet parakeet died, and my mother went out and bought another one, just the same, so that I wouldn't notice. But I knew, and I killed that one too. And I know a man who does that joke, and he gets over one woman per week from it. <laughs> And I also you know... You need a kickback. Yeah, yeah. You need some cash on the side for that. I don't get that. anything. No. And also, there are people who have met uh, and now are married and they've met <laughs> through my humour. Like, people who've been drawn to my inexplicable and ridiculous humour. And then they've, it's led to love. And then, of course, then from love, a short step to marriage. And then from marriage, a short step to a dead-end marriage. <laughs> and then from there, a short step to, oh, come on, why don't you refurbish that? Utility room. Oh, shut up, will you? I'm fed up with you. I can't stand your face once more. But they haven't got to that stage yet because they've only just got married. They're at least five years off the dead-end marriage stage. Yeah. That's few, later. And a few months off of the nagging stage, which we won't even get into. You you travel a lot on airlines. You mentioned airlines uh, take up some part of your your sketch, your routine. Airline anagrams. They're, what are airline anagrams? And tell us about flying, because if you analyse the idiosyncrasies of life, it, just being in an aeroplane would offer so much material. Oh, it's absolutely surreal, isn't it, when you're on a plane? There's so much going on. Although I don't really notice. I, that's the one time, probably, when I don't think of any humour, because I'm just sitting there drinking red wine asleep. <laughs> But I do fly a lot. I mean, I've just come here to Adelaide to direct a sketch group who are also in the Adelaide Fringe, and then I'm going back next week. Mm. Then I'm going to Mauritius for a few days, and then I'm... Cause I'm going to Mauritius, basically, to get somewhere warm. Because it's not been all that warm here in Adelaide, has it? I mean... Are you kidding? We've had a heat wave. A heat over wa- 40... Oh, that I think was we last almost week. got to 46 degrees. That was before I arrived. Oh. I mean, over the weekend, it was about 18 degrees. Mm. Everyone kept saying, oh, it's so hot in Australia. Well, I've seen very little evidence of it so far. But you come from the UK, so uh, so a bit of a sprinkling of rain would be uh, would be like Bermuda. Yeah, it is like... It, yeah. Actually, <laughs> that day when it was raining, it was like... It was like a tropical storm. I stood outside in it all day. <laughs> luxuriating in the the 17 degree heat Uh, but airline anagrams to answer Mm. your previous question 
uh, is uh, it's what it is. It's what you'd expect it to be. Hmm, it's okay. various things linked to airlines that are hmm. then placed into anagram form. Do you know when you're on an airline and you get given the um, the little food, the res- I wanted to say recess, you don't get recess on an airline, a snack. And you know those little Toblerone bars? I always want to say to them, why can't you give us the proper size chocolate? You know, I don't want a mini Toblerone chocolate what, bar. You want to I eat want a whole bi- Toblerone? Yes. That's exactly why I'm not married to you, Belinda. Why? It's always a bad sign, isn't it? <laughs> When you have a when you have a woman sitting there with full size Toblerones <laughs> stuffing them into her mouth, it's always a sign of the low self esteem. There's always issues. There's always a problem. If it's just just a tiny little Toblerone and that's it for the evening. But when you get the large Toblerones, especially on a flight, you know keep away from those women. That's how I judge women. I judge them by the size of their Toblerones. The bigger the Toblerone, the bigger the birth I give them. (laughs) We'll be back in just a moment. I've composed myself now. Our special guest in the studio is comedian Paul Foote, who uh, turned away from his initial desire to be an accountant. You were were studying (laughs) mathematics at Oxford University, Paul. That's right. How did you know that you were any good at making people laugh then? Well, I tried comedy when I was at university and I just immediately decided that was going to be my career and I thought it would be much more interesting to go into show business than being an accountant and I think I was right. You probably I, mean, I haven't right. tried the other one but <laughs> I would have thought so and I have spoken to my accountant and he's confirmed to me it's not that interesting, <laughs> especially my accounts that are very, very boring. Now, your show Kenny Larch is Dead, which you are bringing to Cinema Nova from the 13th till the 17th of March as part of the uh, the Adelaide Fringe. You've already taken it to uh, the Edinburgh Festival and all around the UK. You've had sell-out shows, which I kind of like the idea of that. You've sort of finessed it on, on those audiences and you're bringing us the uh, the tickety-boo show. Absolutely, yeah, mm. that's right. That's the, my, my year begins in in August. That's when I start the new show and it goes through until July. So that's on August the 1st, that's like the comedy New Year. That's when I celebrate my New Year. <laughs> Do you ever have down days, ever have times where you, you're not, you don't feel awfully funny? No, because luckily I'm superhuman, Belinda, and I, no, always, I'm always very positive and very funny every day. Always. <laughs> Your mum and dad must be uh, very proud of you. Uh, well, yes, I think they are, yes. They like to see me travelling around the world. Mm. They like to see me leaving. <laughs> Do you remember the early days when you were making your, your mum laugh? Actually, I didn't really make my mother laugh. I think it's often the way with comedians. It's, it's, you know, we're, we're funny to other people, but to our own family, we're really quite boring. They always, and uh, I think when I started, my mother thought it was all rather ill-advised. Mm. And But then when she saw me going around the world, then she sort of realised that it was quite successful. You know, when, when it got to the stage where I would just suddenly say, I'm just going to New York today, or oh, I'm just going to Australia just for six days, and then she'd think, oh, I think Paul's doing quite well. Beware of the kangaroos hopping down the road. Because people, you know, in the UK and America, they think that that's what happens here, don't they? Well, yes, they think uh, kangaroos hopping, Leighton Hewitt on every corner. Mm. swiping around with this racket, all slightly angry, always a little bit angry. Mm. With his hat on backwards? Yeah, always with mm. his hat, just slightly frustrated. He didn't do slightly better. Mm. I was a bit frustrated watching last night. Did he not win? He didn't win. No, no, mm. never does. <laughs> One thing's not, wi- it's not widely known, this is not widely known, but he hasn't actually won since 1994. A match. I, I mean, no, sorry, I, I got that confused. A point. He hasn't won a point <laughs> since 1994. But because he battled That's... so hard for every point, no one's noticed that he hasn't actually won a point since then. Because he always battles for every point. He always say, well done, Leighton. You really <laughs> went for that one. But no one's actually looked at the statistics, which, when you see them, are pretty stark. Oh, I love it. Now, we mentioned earlier the show uh, Cash in the Attic, which you didn't actually know it was about. Uh, my producer, Angie, says it's similar to Antiques Roadshow. They go into people's attics and try and find things that are worth money, which I thought is quite a great idea for your show. You could 
you could, uh, you know, you've got your audience held captive, they're hostage, you could go into the audience and pickpocket, if you like, see if there's anything worth anything in the in the pockets. Cash in the pockets. Perfect. Cash from the pockets. Yeah. Diamond rings, anything. It's the perfect show for a farewell tour. Really? Because <laughs> I don't think it would lead to much repeat business the following year. In fact, it's really a show that you can only really do once, followed by a a long jail sentence <laughs> and then being deported from Australia rather than the way they do on that on that uh, show you know when the Australian border force mm, mm. Uh, so oh. this is this is a this is a family a nice family from Britain who are looking forward to a nice holiday but one of them's got a deadly apple inside his suitcase the customs officially explains the dangers it could kill everyone in Australia they're deported from Australia on the first available flight. That's the last <laughs> time they'll be seen in Australia. Fruit fly. <laughs> <laughs> the, the fruit fly is no laughing matter. It's it could, very it could destroy. <laughs> it could destroy Australia. Australia is only a tiny place. A couple of fruit flies. I mean, just doesn't bear thinking about what could happen. Oh, Paul, we cannot wait to see you and experience your special brand of humour. I'm just thinking you're, you're jetting back to the UK soon before, before returning for the Adelaide Fringe. I feel for the person sitting next to you. Do, do they try and strike up a conversation and do they get, you know, 24 hours worth of Paul Foot comedy? You should know the rules, Belinda. Never, ever speak to the person next to you. <laughs> Because <laughs> the, I mean, the, the, the problem is, sometimes it can be great, can't it? You talk to the person next to you, mm. and you have a lovely conversation, but uh, most of the time, you, after about 20 minutes, you think, oh, gosh, I wish I'd never started this. And, I can't escape. And it goes for on for hours. But mm. sometimes it's good. Last year, when I came to Australia in February, I met a lady called Moira, and we had a great fun. We, mm. uh, we went on the Royal Brunei, and we bonded over a series of coiffosiers at Dubai Airport. Of, of what? Kavwa... <laughs> it's difficult to say. Kavwosier. What are they? Well, it's alcoholic. Right. And you pour it down. It's marvellous. I, I was went outside to have a sandwich before and I noticed that the, uh, the Felice uh, vacant building next to us has got a liquor licence and I asked the the builders what, what was going in there and it's a new hairdressing salon. You go in there to get a blow dry or a colour and a cut and you can have a couple of glasses of champagne at the same time. So it's a special champagne? Yeah, an alcoholic hair salon. What do you think about that? That's quite a nice idea, isn't it? I mean, we could yeah. have more things like that, like like a Buddhist shopping but a Buddhist supermarket. So you go around the supermarket choosing items and not, and and then there's Buddhism throughout the throughout so you like pick up washing powder, and there's a Buddha behind and he says something like Remember to be at peace and things like that. You combine things. It's good to combine stuff. It's a very good idea. And a lot of people are crying out for Buddhism these days. And there's no actual Buddhism shops because it doesn't really... It's not a commercial venture, is it? I mean, the Buddha, great man, you know, top quality religion, mm. but he didn't really come up with a good business model. <laughs> but I have now. The... Uh, uh, hin, what about hin, when you're at the? Sorry to interrupt you. What about when you're at the? Uh, you know the roast chook and you, or, or the the butchery? Or, yeah. The, the, get, the, get the, the sliced butchers. meats. Yeah, and you take that little number. You know the little. Yeah, little number. number to yeah, wait. We, I'm just thinking we could do something while we're waiting. Yeah, we don't do that in Britain though. That oh, number thing. You're advanced. Like I noticed that in banks. When you go into the bank, you don't just go up and just... You have to take a number and sit there mm. with a different number and you have to decide what your purpose is yes. coming in. What's your purpose? <laughs> is it to pay in money or is it to talk to an account manager about an existing account or is it to discuss a miscellaneous issue? You have to take the right... If you take the wrong thing, they say, sorry, you took D4. You can't go there. You need to speak to someone else and you need a blue thing. And go to, to the blue thing. Wait all over again. It's a nightmare. Paul. I don't have a. I don't. I shouldn't have been in there anyway. I was only in there with my laundry. 
<laughs> so in, any, in many ways, their system is, is the right system because it gets rid of people like me. Oh, Paul, we hope the Adelaide audiences are as welcoming as they were uh, last year. Paul Foote with Kenny Larch is dead at Cinema Nova from the 13th till the 17th of March. Bookings through uh, the adelaidefringe.com.au or 1300 621 255. We've got a double to give away. We might give that away on the other side of the 330 headlines. We'll put a competition or something up. We'll, uh, we'll sort that out on the other side of the break. Paul, great to see you. Thank you so much for giving us a laugh on this Tuesday afternoon. And Thank we look you, forward Belinda. to seeing you at the Adelaide Fringe.